You're listening to Inside the Village, where all news is local and no topic is off limits. So help me, Bob, it's bully in the alley. Hey, hey, bully in the alley. So help me, Bob. Back for another episode of Inside the Village for the week of November the 23rd. 2023. Executive producer Derek Turner is in the room. As always, Michael Friscalanti, editor-in-chief. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Great to have the crew back. Uh, okay, it was a week or so ago uh, since your time with the Prime Minister. Frankly, it's all we've heard. <laughs> but now, <laughs> your incredible journalistic skills have traveled as far as the West Coast, and the story got picked up by uh, an online uh, news organization uh, there. Uh, just applauding your uh, your, <laughs> no, your well, efforts. What was funny about it, Mark Edge, a journalist out there, a great piece for CanadianDimension.com, just wrote about my interview with Trudeau and it was specifically about Bill C-18 and the Online News Act. Obviously, Mark's not a huge fan of the Online News Act. Right. And, and his lead was something along the lines of sometimes it takes a small town journalist to rip the prime minister. So I've clearly graduated from a nobody to a small town journalist. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, uh, it's a big moment. Well, clear, clearly, Mark uh, and and great journalist, um, but in this instant, m- maybe didn't do his homework. Um, <laughs> It's Michael Friscalani, for God's sake. <laughs> Former McLean's. Yeah, that's right. What's editor that? in chief at Village Media. The yeah. guy's a big deal. Not no. a small town journalist. No, I am a small town journalist. I'm proud of it. No. We small. do great small town journalism, Scott. We do. <laughs> we do, and we do it well. And speaking of which, let's uh, propel ourselves into the first word to Frisco. I love this story. <laughs> Speaking of small town. <laughs> Speaking of small town, um, it does not get any better than this. Some llama drama. In the Blue Mountains, courtesy of uh, Erica Engel, the uh, editor at uh, Collingwood Today. Yeah. You know, we often talk about the very serious um, changing journalism we do, the stuff that has an impact. We do a lot of that stuff, but yeah. this is one of those stories that everybody loves. <laughs> this is Erica, as I know the backstory, Eric Engel, who uh, never stops working, is going through her Facebook feed on a Sunday, I think it was. And she saw this post about these llamas that had escaped, escaped their, whatever you want to call it. What is it, a cage? Uh, I think. Uh, I, I don't know enclosure. what enclosure enclosure wherever yeah. they were somebody left the gate open yeah but, which was of course even though it's Sunday she sprung into action got a, the first piece up about these llamas and you know the story as well as I do because you've spoken to her too for your behind the scenes but I guess three of them had escaped they were on the lamb on the lamb <laughs> <laughs> Two L's for what? A couple days? Few days? Well, it, so so it's it's the story of Luca, Lewis, and Todd, the three llamas yeah, uh, who Todd. were, as you alluded to, on on the lamb. Uh, two of them, Luca and Todd, uh, got captured and returned safely November 16th. Okay. Lewis. Lewis. Lewis is the problem lamb in the whole yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, Erica says he's he's the brains of the operation, and he eluded capture for another four days. That's amazing. That's amazing. How were they trying to capture him? Like, were they... They, they, <laughs> they brought in professional wranglers. I mean, Derek, Derek said it best. It's like, it would have been like a scene out of Yellowstone. You know, the cavalry <laughs> you know, coming out of the mountains with the rope. That's you awesome. Know, looking for Louis the Llama. Louis the Llama. And now they're safely back in their cage. They are uh, uh, unharmed. Um, no worries for where they have all been returned safe and That's sound. A great story. Collingwood today on top of it all. Wonderful story. Uh, not so wonderful is, is the Christmas tree in Aurelia. <laughs> Uh, made me think of Charlie Brown's Christmas tree. <laughs> and apparently Jimmy Fallon thought the same. Yeah, I mean, everybody's kind of seen this tree now. It's gone viral. Uh, and it really, like, is this the main Christmas tree they light every year? That's yeah. Why, yeah. So <laughs> if that's the main Christmas tree. Yeah, I, I know, I know. And it's a great, because the crowd's gathered. It's dark outside. They're all excited. And they do the countdown. And it lights up. And it's, I guess it was just the trunk that was lit up, right? With the, with the boat. It, it was, was like was, nine lights yeah, on the tree. Yeah, there was like no reaction. It was like, oh. But the best reaction, the guy who got the best video, once the tree gets lit up, all you hear is, what the hell? What the hell? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was perfect. It was great. And then, of course, it did make Jimmy Fallon. We've got a good run of, of our stories making it to the late U.S. late night program. First, we got the big zucchini and Thorold making it to Stephen Colbert. And now uh, the Aurelia Christmas tree. Uh, and not to mention uh, the giant pumpkin boat. Yes. Uh, out of Sault Ste. Marie that got picked up by uh, this hour has 22 minutes. Yeah. And a crazy twist to that story. I don't know if you saw on Sue today, but one of the lead writers on this hour's 22 minutes is from the Sioux. Jordan Foisey. Yeah. Reached out to Alex and said, hey, great job on that story. By the way, I'm from the Sioux. Yeah. Who knew? And guess what? We did a story on it. 
Now, further irony to that point, Jordan, being from the Sioux, was the one who didn't write the piece. Yeah, for the exactly. Show. Yeah, it's kind of disappointing. Maybe he had a, a it's crazy, a, a more um, a meaner joke that didn't make the uh, didn't make the yeah, cut. Yeah, yeah. It was a good one though. Uh, okay, uh, more seriously, uh, back to the uh, shooting which took place a few weeks ago uh, in Sault Ste. Marie. It's still making headlines, um, and and just uh, an incredible picture of Brian Sweeney in the background when the Prime Minister was in town. Yeah, Ken Armstrong here at Sioux Today, who's been covering a lot of the details about that shooting from the moment it happened, um, and has done the first uh, stories about Angie Sweeney, who was one of the women, uh, the woman who was killed mm-hmm. in this mass shooting along with three children. And um, he's done interviews with with her father and with her close friends and written beautiful stories about who she was and the type of person she was. And uh, out of those stories has come her dad, Brian's, commitment and a mission, basically, to, yes. to, to change the laws around intimate partner violence. He's making it known that he will not stop until the laws are stronger to protect other people from this kind of violence. And... Um, after news broke first on suit today, that November 11th, that morning, we broke the news that the prime minister was coming. Right. He saw the news and s- said to himself, I have to meet the prime minister. Mm-hmm. So the PM's third event of the day, I believe, was at the in the, Legion, the current Legion Hall, which is in the basement of the Marconi, the Marconi Hall here in the Sioux. And he went down there, waited, and, and waited for the chance to, to speak to the prime minister. And Adam Scotty, the prime minister's photographer, actually took a picture of the PM at a table, yeah. smiling and talking with people. And you can see Brian in the background against the wall, just waiting for his opportunity Absolutely. to speak to the PM. And he did have a cordial conversation, a chance to meet the prime yeah. minister, told him who he was, told him that, you know, that I'm not going to rest until I, I see some change here. And uh, to his credit, the next day he had a meeting with our local MP, Terry Sheehan, to talk more about the issue. And uh, I have to say, you know, tragically, in a lot of cases like this where we see terrible things happen, there's often family members left behind who are who want to make a difference. They want to make things better for other people. And we've seen it to varying degrees over the years. But Brian really strikes me as a guy who will not rest until there's some serious discussion about this issue and, and some serious change. So if I was a, a lawmaker in this province or in this country, I would not take him lightly. He has a lot to say, and he's uh, definitely not going to stop talking about it. No, and there was a line in uh, in Ken's story, and I may be paraphrasing here, but when, when Brian introduced himself to the prime minister, uh, he said something to the effect of, I want you to know my name. That's right. Because you're going to be hearing a lot of it. For sure. And I think a lot more people are going to hear his name in the months to come, for sure. And, you know, as Ken also reported, the investigation is still ongoing. The police... I've told the public that they've seized two weapons, a handgun and a long gun. We don't know any more details about that, what type of weapon they were. We don't know if he had a license to carry. We do know he, that this shooter was under a, 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 a gun ban a year before based on another case, but it had expired after he served his probation um, just 10 months before the shooting. So lots of unanswered questions about whether this guy had legal access to firearms. Whose were they? Right. So, you know, we're waiting for those answers from the police, and I think the public deserves to know those answers, and so we're going to keep on it and report whatever we find. All right. First word to Frisco. Okay, today uh, on the show, Restaurant Impossible. Uh, Dalhousie University recently uh, releasing a study uh, that, quite frankly, uh, when it comes to the restaurant industry, it's alarming, the numbers. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, Over 50% of restaurants nationwide are operating in the red. Yep, for sure. Uh, but since the pandemic, a lot have not been able to recover. And the report also goes into detail about how dissatisfied people are with going to restaurants lately, that they're going a lot less, A, because they, the, the, the cost of living has gone up, they don't have enough uh, disposable income to, to go to restaurants, but also because they're disappointed in the service they're getting and what they're getting for their money, right? He, the, the famous term he uses, shrinkflation, that you know we're getting less yeah. and less food and not as good quality on the plates. Um, so it's kind of a real, paints a real portrait of an industry that's struggling for sure right now. Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Sylvain Charlebois from Dalhousie University uh, will join us to talk about that study and uh, other things, including inflation and shrinkflation. That's next when Inside the Village returns right after this. Reporters, editors, and journalists who go the extra mile to get the story and get it right. Go behind the scenes with those who cover the stories that matter most to you and your community. Look for it in the Village Features section of your favourite Village Media website across Ontario.
Welcome back to Inside the Village with Michael Friscalanti, Editor-in-Chief here at Village Media. I'm Scott Sexsmith. Pleased to be joined today on the program by Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, the Director of Agri-Food Analytics Lab at Dalhousie University in uh, my hometown of Halifax, hometown, yeah, Nova Scotia. That, yeah. Beautiful East Coast. I great forgot you from there. Great sure. food, uh, great restaurants, and uh, we're going to talk to uh, uh, the good doctor about uh, restaurants. Doctor, first of all, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you. I had no idea you came from Halifax. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Navy brat and uh, lived there many, many, <laughs> many years ago, uh, but was actually just recently back there uh, about a month or so ago. I learned you, something new every day. There you go. We'll just talk about Scott for the rest <laughs> of the interview. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, Halifax, Halifax has changed quite a bit. I've been there for seven years, and it's just a beautiful city. It got even more beautiful in recent years. Uh, the uh, the waterfront, the boardwalk is absolutely spectacular. What a great vibe down there. Yep. Yeah, very cool. Absolutely. Okay, uh, doctor, you recently uh, wrote an article that started this way. The Canadian restaurant industry, once a thriving and beloved sector of our nation's culture, is facing a severe crisis, one that is as much about survival as it is about maintaining image. Let's start there. What is the crisis? Well, first of all, uh, according to Restaurants Canada, 51% of its members are actually losing money. And so we all know that the restaurant business is a high-risk business. Uh, One restaurant out of five will survive uh, the first five years, so we all know that. But uh, it it just gotten worse in recent years just because of financial headwinds that the sector is facing. Obviously, COVID didn't help. Uh, The cost of food has gone up. Uh, to uh, maintain margins has been very difficult. A lot of people think that uh, food service is all about high margins. Not so. Same as retail. Uh, Margins are very, very low. So you're always a couple of mistakes away from losing money. And that's kind of what's going on. Of course, we have to add to the pile labor issues, uh, rent. If you're not owning a building, uh, you're on the hook for probably a a higher rent. Uh, And so that's, that's been the issue. And the other troubling stats that we came up with is the fact that a lot of people are leaving the restaurant experience being not being satisfied. Mm-hmm. And uh, only 29% of Canadians actually are satisfied with their experience uh, based on the money spent. So people are spending a lot more money. Uh, so what we also find out is that expectations have actually changed also. And that's that's dangerous. So if, you, if you're actually continuously letting people leaving your establishment being not being satisfied you're not going to see them again uh doctor when you say not being satisfied with the experience is that overall or is that specific to one thing uh the service uh the portion size or is that the overall experience it's the overall experience things that people have noticed are portion sizes of course uh we've also noticed that people are seeing uh food that is not as uh, not of the same quality and of course because of the labor shortage you're con- you're consistently training people and when people are in training they don't necessarily uh, they're not mm-hmm. optimal and so people are noticing as well and at the end of the night when you're given your invoice your bill well you have to add an extra 15 20 25 percent on that uh, for for the tip and so people kind of add things up and say, is this really worth it to actually go out uh, not being overly satisfied, uh, being overcharged and then leave and, and not feeling, you know, not feeling that you, you got your money's worth. And in the economic climate we're living in now, people are worried about the cost of so many things. It is kind of easy to say, you know what, I think today we're just not, we're not going to go out this weekend to a restaurant. I'm sure a lot of people are feeling that way, right, doctor? Oh, absolutely. Listen, in retail, things are really, really bad. I mean, I don't want to be the uh, Debbie Downer here, but <laughs> when you look at when you look at the data, gentlemen, right now Canadians are spending less at the grocery store uh, compared to last year, despite food inflation. So last year, the average Canadian, according to StatsCan, the average Canadian was spending two hundred sixty-five bucks a month on food retail. It's down to two fifty-five. Mm-hmm. So people are absolutely trading down. They're visiting different stores they haven't visited before, i.e. Giant Tiger, dollar stores, to get food. That's the reality. So do you think food service is a priority now for a lot of people? 
Likely not. No, exactly. And because of that, you talk about this 51% of restaurants that are operating at a loss. We're seeing that in real life, right? In our own communities, we see the very popular, maybe some of the older restaurants, the places that have been around a long time, closing their doors. Yeah. It's devastating for people in that way, not only for the businesses, but for the people who've enjoyed those restaurants over the years. Are you seeing a lot of, are you hearing from people? Are, are, are restaurant owners reaching out to you because they see your expertise? Uh, well, we talk to Restaurants Canada mm-hmm. all the time, mm-hmm. uh, probably once a month. In fact, the president and CEO will be on our podcast uh, in about a month from now, I guess, uh, we've had people from Restaurants Canada coming to, on our show uh, on a regular basis, but, but they need our help. But here's the thing about Restaurants Canada. It's a it's a tough organization. They represent everyone, mm-hmm. like fast food, bars, mm-hmm. taverns, mm-hmm. Uh, fine dining, casual dining. They all have different uh, needs. Now, when you look at the restaurant landscape right now, I would say... I wouldn't be too worried about the McDonald's and the RBIs of this world. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're doing fine. Look at their look at their financial statements. They're doing very well, in mm-hmm. fact, in a trading down economy. Uh, what I'm worried about are uh, independent operators. They're the ones really, they're the real innovators, but they're also the ones feeling the real pressures right now. Uh, doctor, we hear the term uh, quite frequently now, shrinkflation. Can you explain that uh, to our audience and what that term means? The most annoying term of 2023, <laughs> I guess. Uh, I mean, shrinkflation is uh, de facto a strategy. Uh, it is to uh, retain market share by reducing portion sizes, reducing costs, but not um, not uh, adjusting the price. So as a consumer, you're basically getting less for the same price. I think a lot of people have actually noticed uh, that uh, some of the products have actually been shrinkflated. Uh, we believe that in 2023, about 20 products were shrinkflated. Uh, very, very well-known products. Uh, but other than that, I mean, over the years, we've seen hundreds of products uh, being impacted by the strategy. It's not new. But it's annoying for a lot of people just because of of this uh, food inflation storm we're in. People are looking for anything and everything. And there's also skimflation, the quality of the food. That's another inflation, tideflation, uh, greedflation, you name it. There's inflation. There's a new inflation every month. <laughs> it's a great line. <laughs> new flation. Well, speaking of new inflations, what 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 and what? This the thing that everyone's been talking about for months, just the, the the sticker shock at the grocery store. Do you see any relief at all in sight, doctor, for the average person at the grocery store in the months to come? Well, I, I can make a prediction about shrinkflation for sure. I mean, they tend to we tend to see more cases when commodity prices go up. Mm-hmm. When input costs go up, manufacturers adjust, mm-hmm. and that's how they adjust. Now, what we're looking at right now is a market where commodity prices are actually depressed compared to last year. Uh, last year's uh, Ukrainian effect, the invasion of Ukraine, uh, really got pushed most commodity prices much higher. For example, uh, a bushel of wheat was at $13, which is a record. Mm-hmm. Now it's down to about six. So I wouldn't worry too much about shrinkflation for 2024, except for perhaps chocolate. If you like chocolate, Go out and buy now, gentlemen. Because <laughs> cocoa, Got it. cocoa futures is at a 44-year high, and sugar, sugar also is quite expensive right now. Really, I hadn't heard that. Why? What's no. what's driving that? Sugar is basically uh, sugar canes uh, mm. down south. Uh, production has been uh, subpar. Uh, cocoa, same thing uh, in the Ivory Coast and uh, and uh, also in uh, New Guinea. Those are countries that do produce a lot of cocoa and uh, production hasn't been uh, hasn't been efficient or effective so that's why we're paying more that's basically it and that all of these elements uh, are due to uh, climate changing mm-hmm. we know you're a busy man so we won't keep you much longer just a couple more questions just to, to touch again on on the survey that your lab did you surveyed more than 5500 canadians what other things from that research uh, stuck out to you uh it's the other thing that really uh, kind of surprised me is that you can there is hope for restaurant operators i think uh, and that boils down to loyalty mm. if you actually get together if you work together with other independents and i'm talking about independence here if you get together and create some sort of passport or give 
gift certificates to people, they will reward you back if you actually give them an incentive. That's the one thing that came up quite a lot. Hmm. So you can disappoint them. It can be tough uh, for you. The economic environment may be very difficult for you, but there is hope. You can actually get people back. And right now, we're into uh, the holiday season, basically. And so a lot of people are organizing parties. And the one thing they'll be looking at are menu prices before anything else. Mm-hmm. Uh, doctor, before we let you go, a uh, quick question, and it's a bit of a personal one. Have you found that uh, your dining out habits have changed at all recently? Uh, well, I travel a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> I Including mean, right I, now, I'm very obviously. Acquainted, <laughs> I'm very acquainted with the Maple Leaf Lounge. So if you, if you, <laughs> if you count that, well, I guess uh, I haven't changed my habits. <laughs> but, I mean, we are careful. I mean, we're, we're a family, and uh, like everyone else, we, we feel – we feel the brunt of, of food inflation, so we're, we're, we're very careful. We're, we're blessed with the fact that we don't have a heavy mortgage to carry, and uh, so we've been lucky in that regards, but we do volunteer quite a bit at our food bank uh, in Nova Scotia, Feed Nova Scotia. In fact, this weekend, we were doing the Santa Claus Parade volunteering, and I'm on the board of Second Harvest in Toronto, uh, the largest food bank in Canada, uh, so I give back in that way because I know a lot of people are suffering right now. All right, Dr. Sylvain Charlebois, currently uh, in BC. Safe travels uh, back to the East Coast, uh, and thanks for doing this today. Take care. Bye-bye. For the latest in in in-depth features and enterprise journalism from your local writers at Village Media, be sure to check out The Big Read. The Big Read, it's the full story behind the headlines. Look for The Big Read on your favourite Village Media website across Ontario. Back to wrap on uh, Inside the Village for the week of November the 23rd, 2023. Uh, Sylvain Charlebois, great uh, discussion. Uh, he's not big on that term shrinkflation, but Derek brought up a good point too uh, during the commercial break. Pot of gold, remember those? Yeah, the chocolates? Yeah, just Toronto Sun, Derek. Toronto Sun has uh, just ran a story uh, today, in fact, that shows how the package is the same size, but they've gone from 24 pieces to 12. <laughs> they, don't even, they don't even try to hide it. They basically slashed in half. Yeah. Well, what about even, not that I eat my kids' Halloween candy. Okay, I do. Uh, the bags Watch. of chips. Like, there's like three chips. <laughs> It's crazy. it's crazy. You have to open like 40 bags of chips to I get know. to get like a decent bowl of chips. Yeah. Like so I mean, it's like they're counting uh they're counting the chips going in that bag. I know. It's been like that in the grocery stores for a while though, right? You get the big bag of Lay's, yeah. half of it is there. Yeah. It's true. Someone needs to do a story on that. They should. You know anyone? <laughs> What's that? Do you know anyone? <laughs> I know. We got we got to get on that. <laughs> I, I may know a small town journalist that, <laughs> that could that could probably, <laughs> probably No. All right. <laughs> It's uh, going to be on my business card. So, quick question, and and either one of you can chime in. H- has has your dining out habits changed um, post COVID? You know, we haven't. We don't dine out a lot, to be honest. We yep. do eat at home a lot, of, um, a lot. So, I don't think it's changed. I think we're probably going out the rare time. Yeah, it's usually if we everyone has a bunch of hockey events going on. And we sure, go and eat something. Um, I'm trying to think if I've been disappointed lately in a restaurant. I don't think I have. Um, but I do know people in the restaurant industry, and they've sort of talked anecdotally about just how much more difficult it is to run a restaurant, too. They're, they're dealing with skyrocketing prices as yep. well, right? Yep. They're dealing with huge staff turnover all the time. Like, they hire people, they can't keep them. And so those pressures are on them. How about you? Not really. Like you, we don't uh, we don't go out a ton. Um, so I, it, it's had very little uh, impact uh, on us. And, and quite frankly, I haven't noticed um, much of a difference uh, when it comes to shrinkflation, but I guess it's you know due in large part to the fact that uh, uh, we d- we don't go out a lot. Derek, you notice? No, I haven't noticed it too much. Yeah, we don't eat out a lot either, though. So it's right. interesting too what he talked about how like how the restaurant industry association represents everybody from like McDonald's yeah. <laughs> to like the small mom and pop shop who are kind of 
at opposite ends of the spectrum, I would think, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're yeah. At different things. So, and I think he mentioned it too, that, you know, the places like McDonald's are going to keep doing well, like they always do, right? It's the smaller, you know, independent guys that are in some trouble. Absolutely. Okay. Tell us what you think about uh, shrinkflation, inflation uh, at ITV at Village Media. Uh, .ca. And of course, uh, watch all back episodes across the uh, Village Media Network or wherever you get your uh, favorite podcast. For Derek Turner, executive producer of the show, uh, Michael Friscalanti, editor-in-chief. I'm Scott Sexman. We'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to Inside the Village. Frisco and Scott's wardrobe provided in part by Moore's Sault Ste. Marie.